Something that's missing from our picture of chemical reactions, if we just think of them as you know, substance A and substance B react to form substance C and substance D, we're missing out on the dynamic aspect of what's going on. Shown here is the detonation of some ordnance by the United States Air Force. And it's clear there's a lot happening in this reaction, more than just converting between one substance and another. So in order to be able to express the difference between, you know, for example, an explosion or having a reaction just kind of fizz a little bit and casually produce some gases, we're going to need to introduce the idea of thermochemistry, which is the study of the energy given off or absorbed in the course of chemical reactions. Now, what is energy actually? Well, that's very hard to answer because energy is very fundamental. It's really more of a concept that we've created to help us understand some of the properties of the universe. We never actually observe energy directly. We just observe things which have energy as a property. So does energy even exist? That might be an open philosophical question. But we can go ahead and, and characterize the properties of whatever this concept is that we mean by energy. So energy is a physical quantity which has these two properties. First of all, we can convert between different forms of energy. So the chemical energy stored in the chemical bonds of our substances, gravitational energy, for example, that's stored in water in a waterfall, kinetic energy that's stored in the motion of particles or any other form of energy. We can take any of these and transform them into other kinds. And the only rule that we have to add is that the total is always going to be conserved. So we're never going to create or destroy energy. We can take energy from one object and give it to another object. We can take energy of one form and translate it into another form. But what we aren't going to do is make energy which has never existed before or destroy energy which presently exists. Now for our purposes in thermochemistry, there are really just two different types of energy that we're going to be interested in. The first type is work. This is the ordered transfer of energy. So for example, if you push an object, there's a definite direction to that. There's some order to the way that you're applying that energy. And so this would be an example of work. Work also has a mathematical definition in this case. And it's going to be equal to the force that we're applying times the distance over which we apply it. Our other form of energy is heat. And so unlike work, this is the transfer of randomized energy. So we can't draw an arrow and say that this is the direction that all of our units of energy are moving. An example of this would be the kinetic energy of gas molecules. Let's say that we have two gases. We have one gas with lots of kinetic energy, so this will be a hot gas. And we have another gas with very little kinetic energy, so that will be a cool gas. Well, this energy is directed in all sorts of different orientations. And if we wait a while, the gases will eventually reach the same temperature. So they'll have the same average kinetic energy. So this is a, a general property of heat, is that it spontaneously flows between objects. And a measure of how likely an object is to give away its heat in a spontaneous way is temperature. And so if you have a, a hot object that has a very high temperature, that means it's, it's very willing to give away its heat to other cooler objects. And in general, you know, if you stick your hand up in the air while the sun is shining, you're going to spontaneously absorb heat from the sun because the sun is hot and you are much cooler. And so this is a, a property of heat that it will spontaneously transfer between different substances and hotter substances tend to give heat away to cooler substances. 
There's a very important experiment which kicks off our understanding of the relationship between heat and work. And this experiment is performed by James Prescott Joule in the middle of the 19th century. Joule is a brewer by trade. He makes beer. And in the course of making beer, you have to keep it at certain temperatures. You have to keep it regulated. And James wants to be very good at this and make a lot of money. So he's trying to figure out what's the most economical way to provide this energy. And so in the course of performing some experiments, one of the things that he does is he measures how much heat energy is going to be provided by doing certain mechanical actions. And so he comes up with this experiment. He has a weight attached to a string. Now, as the, the weight falls, we saw that the work is going to be equal to the force which is acting on it, in this case the force of gravity times the distance moved, which is just going to be the height here. The force of gravity is equal to the, the mass of the object times the gravitational constant or surface. And so you can very easily calculate the energy from this action. Now the mass is tied by string wrapped around this little pinwheel here. And so as the mass falls, it's going to spin the pinwheel. And what's that going to do? That's going to churn the water, causing random motion. Now, remember, randomized energy is heat energy. So we're going to measure that increase in heat on the thermometer, and we'll be able to measure the heat energy, which is transferred to the system. And what Joule observes in the course of performing this experiment is that the total amount of energy here is conserved and apparently heat and work are different forms of energy which you can convert between one and the other. Now uh, a quick note, so Joule has, has established this very important result. Um, it's actually very controversial no one believes him at the time, partly because his experiments are so good, they don't realize what delicate apparatuses he has as a, a brewer, that he can perform experiments no one else can do, and because everyone thinks that heat is a fluid which transfers and is always conserved. And so Joule accepts the, upsets the status quo, but he's very persistent about it and he eventually convinces people. Now, because it's such a monumental result, um, in his honor, the SI unit of energy is named the joule. And so this is a derived unit in fundamental SI units. It's kilograms times meters squared divided by second squared. Now we also use a calorie. A uh, calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. This is now the definition of a calorie. Previously, though, um, calorie was defined as the energy to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. We're also going to find it to be useful to measure heat and calories because we often have our aqueous systems. And so this is a pretty handy relationship when you're dealing with chemistry that involves a lot of water. Now imagine here that we have some system and the system has an impermeable barrier around it that's not going to allow any heat energy to be transferred and no work is going to be able to be done on the system. So this is going to be an isolated system. Well, the first law of thermodynamics, which is essentially what Joule has discovered, is that the total energy within this system, all the work energy and all the heat energy added together, is going to remain constant. It's not going to increase, it's not going to decrease. I'm going to introduce some notation here. This delta means change. So the change in the energy is going to be zero. There's not going to be any energy added, there's not going to be any energy subtracted. And it's very convenient to measure energy as a change because then you don't have to figure out what the energy already is, you just have to figure out if anything is added or subtracted to it. So this being true, 
corollary is that only an outside system could possibly add or subtract energy. So if we relax our stipulation that this is an impermeable barrier, and we say now that work can be done on the system from the outside, or the system can do work on the outside, and heat can be dumped into the system or extracted from the system, then now the change in energy of the system is going to be precisely equal to however much heat energy we add or subtract, however much work energy we add and subtract from outside of the system. So this is also another way of stating the first law of thermodynamics in a mathematical form. Now note, if we don't have any work and we don't have any heat from outside, then this reduces to the change in energy of the system is just equal to zero. But when we're inside the system, we are free to go ahead and convert back and forth between heat and work. So we can, for example, run a steam engine and turn heat into work. Or, of course, of running our motor, friction produces a lot of heat, and so our, our work gets transferred back into heat energy. But the total energy in the system is going to remain constant. And so if the change in our energy in this, this isolated system is zero, then that must mean from our formula that heat energy is going to be equal to minus the, ch the work energy and vice versa if we're converting back and forth between these. Something that's hugely important in this discussion of work and heat energy is our sign convention for whether the heat transfer or the work transfer is positive or it's negative. This is the kind of thing that if you get it wrong, then your rocket, instead of successfully landing on the surface of Mars, is going to explode on the launch pad. If anything, this is possibly more important than the actual numerical values that you come up with. So we want to have good sign conventions or all the answers will turn up wrong. Our first convention is that if we do work on the system, then that's going to have a positive sign associated with it. And what's our system? Our system is whatever we decide it should be. We can draw our box around anything, and then any work which is done from outside of that box onto something that's inside of the box, that's going to have a positive sign. If something inside of our box does something to something outside of the box and we'll have a negative sign. Our convention for heat is that if heat is transferred into the system from the surroundings, then we're going to say that, that gets a positive sign. Conversely, if heat goes from our system into the surroundings, it would have a negative sign. And in general, if the system gains any energy from that which surrounds it, then we're going to call that change in energy positive. And conversely, if our energy was given from the system to the surroundings, it would be negative. And we could just as well flip those, but this is how we're going to define it. And so we're going to need to be consistent with this. So as an example, what are the signs on Q, which is our heat, W, which is our work, and delta E, which is our change in energy, if we happen to drop a ball? And we're going to say in this case that the ball is the system. OK, well, the ball gains no heat in this case by the simple act of dropping it. I don't be don't get confused here and you know think several steps ahead and say, oh well, the ball is going to hit the pavement and it's going to deform against the ground and that's going to produce heat energy. That's that's well and true, but that's not what we're asking about. Right now we're just asking about the act of dropping the ball. So in that case, there's no heating of the ball, and the ball doesn't heat its surroundings in any appreciable way. So we're gonna say that our quantity of heat Q is zero in this case. Now the ball is acted on by a force. 
we have our force of gravity acting over a distance. So force acting over distance is how we define work. And so in this case, the work is done on the ball. The, the outside surroundings, the gravitational force from the Earth is acting on our system. So that makes it a positive sign. And then our formula from the first law of thermodynamics is that the change in energy of our system is equal to the amount of external heat that we add or subtract from the system plus the amount of external work energy we add or subtract from the system. So in this case, it's gonna be zero heat energy plus some positive quantity of work and so zero plus some positive number is going to give us a positive number for the change in internal energy of the system. Another example, let's ask what are going to be the signs on the heat and the work and the change in the internal energy of a log when it burns. And we're going to say in this case that the log is the system. Well, the log, let's go ahead and draw a box around the log to define it as our system. Well, if, if you're standing out here, you're gonna feel the warmth of the fire hitting you. So clearly you are receiving heat from this log. So heat is moving out of the system and into the surroundings. By our convention, that means the change in heat for energy for the log is going to be negative and for you it's going to be positive and now there's not really any force acting in this case and so the amount of work energy in this case is zero and then our total energy change is going to be the amount of external heat energy added or removed plus the amount of work energy added or removed. And so in this case, negative plus zero gives us a negative quantity. So the overall change in energy for our log is going to be negative. One last example. Say we have a gas that expands into the atmosphere. So that's going to involve pushing the external atmosphere away, doing some work on it. In this case, it does 15 joules of work on the external atmosphere. Now also is going to receive some heat energy from the atmosphere, which is apparently warmer than the gas. And so it receives 81 joules of heat energy. What is the change in energy for the atmosphere? Well, it always helps to have a picture in front of us. So we have this gas and this gas is expanding and doing work in the atmosphere. It's receiving heat energy from the atmosphere. And our system here that we're interested in is the atmosphere. It's not this gas, it's outside of this gas. So the heat energy transferred to the atmosphere, the atmosphere is giving away heat to this gas, so it's gonna have a negative quantity. So it's gonna be minus 81 joules. And then work is done on the atmosphere by this gas. So that's gonna make this a positive quantity of 15 joules. Uh, so then our total energy change for the atmosphere is gonna be the heat transfer to the atmosphere plus the, the work done on the atmosphere. So that will be our minus 81 plus our 15 gives us a total of 66 joules of energy. So our atmosphere is going to increase 66 joules in energy because of this process.